Yes, good morning or afternoon or evening as the case may be. I see that you're all over the world. Welcome today to our master lecture and I'm just really thrilled that we could have Dr. Joshua Taylor back. Uh, he was here before pre uh, speaking about cyberbullying and he was also involved in a research project that we had um, about it was about treating PTSD in returning veterans, and we were going to use some sort of video conferencing or video counseling, or as we came up today with possibly Skype counseling, but we're um, presently going to resurrect that project, and we're in the process now of filling out the IRB and getting the appropriate approvals and permissions, but we would like to do something on the efficacy of the treatment of veterans with PTSD that are returning from the wars using brainwave entrainment therapy oh, and <laughs> cognitive therapy. I'm so impressed with your credentials, the Western <laughs> Regional Program Manager in San Bernardino County over the behavioral mental health there. He has over 50 clinicians that he, that he supervises as well as he's a published author and he's made counseling videos on comorbidity in the treatment of PTSD, as well as substance abuse in military families. So without further ado, Dr. Taylor. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to start certainly by saying thank you to Dr. Grimes and Cal Southern University for inviting me back. Um, certainly appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, veterans. It's a, a subject that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I want to also thank all of our past, current, and former veterans for their service. And I know sometimes uh, we get stuck in faraway places, so it's nice to be able to come here and uh, talk to, um, to folks that are kind of virtual and in different parts of the world. So I'm really excited to be back. Um, when I thought about this presentation, you know, I wanted to mix a little bit of the uh, maybe known or maybe sometimes unknown culture and aspects of, of being in the military with uh, some elements of clinical work in, in PTSD and some of the things that uh, I've gone through. What I've found many times is that there is a tremendous amount of people that want to work with veterans and want to help, uh, but may not necessarily kind of understand all of the pieces of it. And so it uh, really was nice to have, that, have an opportunity to kind of talk about that and share some of the things. So I kind of came up with this topic of inside the mind. So we're, we're not going to delve too much into the biology, so to speak, of, of the brain, but talk a little bit more about uh, the culture and some of the things that kind of go into becoming a veteran and what that means. So we'll go ahead and get started. A little bit about my background. I started out uh, five days after graduating high school uh, with a fresh new haircut. And so I went into the United States Air Force uh, and was trained as a military police officer with a bomb dog. Um, the military's wonderful sense of humor. My uh, dog was trained to find explosives and had a wonderful name of Duck, uh, D-U-X, because uh, it was from uh, Germany, which I thought was rather ironic for, some, for a bomb dog that found bombs. And every time I would give out commands and had to yell Duck, you know, everybody was uh, on edge. So <laughs> a little bit of humor there. Um, been involved with San Bernardino County Sheriff on their uh, search and rescue team. I retired from that team uh, a few years ago. Uh, doctorate in clinical psychology. My dissertation was on the treatment of uh, grief and depression or trauma and grief in female police officers uh, using the CBT and attachment approach. So I've taught at a few different schools uh, and I enjoy teaching. It's certainly a way to I think stay connected uh, to subject matters and then I currently work for Department of San Bernardino Behavioral Health. Uh, I'm here today just kinda on my own. I'm not representing the department. Uh, I'm just representing myself uh, so that's kind of the disclaimer before I get started. All opinions and information shared in this presentation are my own. So when we talk about understanding military culture, I really want to start by 
um, highlighting what it is what we do, um, how it can inform treatment, a little bit about what each branch of service does. I think that sometimes we tend to maybe lump all veterans together and there's some very distinct differences in terms of the mission and the training and the orientation that for folks that are uh, clinically oriented and going to be working with, with veterans, it's, I think it's important to understand that if you're working with somebody who was in the Marine Corps, that could be very, a very different experience than working with somebody who, like myself, was in the Air Force. And there's always a uh, friendly rivalry between the services. So I know uh, folks in the, uh, that have served in the Marine Corps always give us flyboys in the Air Force a hard time because we have wonderful chow halls and nice bases and you know, nice little rooms and, and they're sleeping in tents. So, uh, I, but I think that context is important. So that's kind of where I'm going to start uh, this morning and kind of share a little bit about that, share a little about my experiences, and then we'll get into some of the PTSD and, and, and trauma stuff. So I think we need to start when we're talking about understanding a veteran and understanding what they go through. <clears throat> I think we have to really start at the beginning. And the beginning is you're taking somebody who's very young at 18, sometimes uh, even 17 and a half if they've graduated high school and have uh, their parents' permission. You're taking somebody who's very young. You're also taking, uh, at least what we know now with some of our current research, with an adolescent brain that is still somewhat developing. Uh, you know, our brain formation doesn't really stop until we get into our early 20s. So you still have a lot of plasticity, a lot of conditioning uh, that can go into that. And so you're taking someone who has grown up in a civilian uh, environment, right, with lots of freedom of expression and freedom of speech and all of these wonderful things that we get to do, uh, freedom of movement, uh, that uh, when you go into the military, gets stripped away from you. And that's probably one of the first things that I experienced is uh, sleep deprivation and uh, loss of freedom of movement. Uh, when I went into basic training, uh, uh, we were shipped down to a processing center, uh, at least on the West Coast, into San Diego. You are made to undress, dress, do all kinds of funky exercises, and walk around on cold floors, and then you get shipped off to your training center. And Mine was in Texas in the middle of June, which was very uh, cool and comfortable climate. If any of you have been in San Antonio in June, the humidity is always at 100%, it seems. And so you're kept up till 2 in the morning, you know, and you get off a bus, and now all of a sudden you're in this completely new environment. You're away from home. You're away from your standard support systems, you know, your coping mechanisms, and you're thrust into this new environment. And that's where everything begins and starts this very intense process of both physical and mental conditioning. I think that that's a very salient point to keep in mind. That when we are training soldiers and airmen and uh, sailors and the Coast Guard and infantry folks from the Marines, you're taking uh, someone and transforming them into uh, a warrior. Uh, all basic training uh, in the military is relatively the same, meaning there is an aspect of drill and marching and shooting weapons that everybody goes through, right? regardless of uh, the branch of service that you're in. And that can range from 30 to 160 days of just that initial physical aspect and, and the mental aspects of transforming kind of who you are. And it starts with breaking down the individual. You're stripped of your clothes, you're stripped of your hair, right? You're stripped of your freedom of movement. You're told where to go, when to go, how to go. And you learn very, very quickly that, you know, uh, that those are the things that you need to do to uh, avoid the consequences, as it were. And so that's your initial exposure into the military, and everybody goes through that. After that comes, uh, depending on the type of work that you're going to do in the military, comes another year to three years of sometimes extremely intense conditioning. When you look at our uh, folks that go into frontline combat, 
that are in uh, special forces, you have a tremendous amount of physical and, 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 and mental training that you're going to go through to prepare for that role. And it's very, I think it's very important not to overlook that and what that does to the individual. I think uh, maybe metaphorically you could say that the person that enters into the military in a sense transforms and maybe even dies. Some aspects of who they were, some aspects of their personality really changes. Uh, certainly on when they um, finish their training and when they come out. And so uh, as clinicians, I always try to stress the importance of really trying to understand that piece because um, if you've never woken up at 5.30 in the morning to Reveille uh, and been yelled at and then forced to uh, move with a certain expeditiousness to go out and exercise and then march in line to... Uh, get food in a chow hall, you're missing out. I recommend it for everybody. But uh, without having those experiences, I think it's important to ask those questions and really be sensitive to that experience uh, because that's, that's the first part of being uh, in the military. That's what kind of, when you want to look inside the mind of someone who's been a veteran, that's where it starts. So we kind of go from there. The other piece to keep in mind is there's a strong sense of culture and tradition with every branch of service. Uh, and so when you're looking at uh, the Marine Corps, there's a tremendous uh, history there that I think needs to be honored, which is very different uh, than other branches of service. We all have our own unique history and culture that we are conditioned to learn and conditioned to uh, recite sometimes at a moment's notice, and that sticks with you. And so um, some of the things I wanted to highlight were certainly uh, these things that are very different when you're looking at um, civilian life. Uh, civilians um, don't always maybe appreciate uh, the complexity of um, very mission-oriented uh, types of things that the military is going to do. And so it's really ingrained in you from the very beginning the sense of uh, commitment, uh, mission, uh, strength, courage, your friends, the things that uh, you need to do for the person next to you, and the ultimate, in a sense, sacrifice is your life. I mean, that's really what we're talking about, right? I mean, anyone in the military at any given time can be sent, can be given a rifle, be sent to a combat zone and have to fight and die. I want to let that sit with you for a minute because I think it's underappreciated that every veteran, when they sign up, they volunteer to abide by the Uniform Code of Military Justice, uphold the Constitution, up to and including their life if necessary. And that's a very significant check to write. And so I think that that deserves a, a tremendous amount of respect. Um, certainly when we talk about camaraderie, when you are, in my case, in Texas in the middle of the summer with 100% you know, humidity in a World War II building with no air conditioning and very comfortable green wool blankets. I'll never forget the itchy, scratchy green wool blankets. And I don't know why they still use them, but I think it's because they can be folded into these perfect little triangles on the end of your bed that every, I think probably every serviceman has probably had to do in their basic training. And so you learn to bond very strongly with uh, the others in your unit. Uh, that's your home, in a sense, and they become part of your family. And those bonds tend to uh, endure the other piece, um, and I'll talk about a little bit about it later as we get into the, the treatment aspects of PTSD, but part of the culture that I think we have to recognize within the military is there is uh, an element of this camaraderie and history, but alcohol plays a very important role in the culture of the military, uh, going back generationally. So uh, one of the things that I've 
really stressed if you're working with veterans, certainly veterans with PTSD, you always, always, always have to be screening for substance use issues. Uh, it's just kind of put it on your list of things that you must do. You know, as, as clinicians, you know, we're always trained to assess for safety and assess for, you know, X, Y, and Z. If you're working with veterans, you should always be assessing and screening for uh, substance use issues because it just is. Um, I can remember being, you know, uh, before I was 21, I won't tell you what age it was, but certainly being stationed uh, at one of my first posts and uh, the first, one of the first experiences I had uh, at this new post after my shift was going out and getting drunk. That's, you know, again, it's part of that you want to fit in. These are your, this is, these are your brothers. Uh, and so uh, it's something to keep in mind. Um, lastly, uh, for this slide, there's very different roles with different branches. So you have your, uh, for in, in my case, the, the Air Force. There's not a lot of uh, frontline combat troops within the Air Force. There are some. There are some very specialized units that do that. Uh, but for the most part, the Air Force has logistics. It has, you know, your pilots, your 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 fighter pilots, your bombers, uh, which is a very different uh, mission, if you will. You have your 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 fighting men, which are primarily your Army and your Marine Corps. These are the guys that are boots on the ground that are out there, you know, with uh, you know 80 pounds of gear, you know, in terrible conditions, um, fighting the the battle. In, and you have your uh, Navy, your sailors, uh, who are, uh, you know, on the big ships, providing a variety of different uh, supports, both tactically with, with weapons and, and uh, logistically with supplies and, and fuel. So my advice, I guess, if you're wanting to understand uh, part of the mind of a veteran uh, clinically and to treat them, is to do your research, understand uh, what each branch of service really does as it relates to who you're treating because they can be very different. Uh, lastly, uh, gender roles are actually changing now uh, in the military. Um, in my case, uh, when I enlisted in 1992, I guess that kind of shows my age a little bit, almost, gosh, was it 20 years ago? Eesh. Anyway, um, women had a very defined role in the military. They were not anywhere near frontline combat, uh, aside from some very limited um, nurses in, in uh, bases, uh, base hospitals, they, were not they weren't exposed to uh, a lot of uh, what we would consider enemy fire or combat roles. And that's now changing. Uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, there's a lot of women that were um, part of army units, whether it was logistical, whether it was um, unspecified, that uh, you know came under fire, that actually were now involved in a firefight, involved in a combat role. And just recently this year, the United States Army actually has a uh, has uh, included a group of women in its Ranger uh, training, uh, which is something that's very new. So, you know, as we look to the future as providers, we're really now going to have to explore how are we going, you know, what does that mean? You know, what's it going to mean for uh, a unit? What will it mean for the individual who has served in a direct uh, combat role? And so that's something that's uh, going to be uh, certainly worth exploring from a research perspective, but also clinically how do we adapt our clinical practices for that? Because uh, not only will it have an impact on uh, the veteran, but also the family members, the other members of the unit. Uh, you know, society as, as a whole, I think, still has some very defined gender roles in our head. And so how do, how do we reconcile ourselves with that when we put uh, women into combat? And so or women on submarines, which is also something that's uh, starting to change. So just some things to kind of think about uh, moving forward. So, you know, military culture has a long history um, of sacrifice and honoring that sacrifice. And one of the things 
I think is important uh, clinically, uh, certainly working with veterans who are uh, returning from our current conflicts, is really trying to understand that sacrifice, understand um, what it meant to them, understand the sense of loss. Uh, you know, when uh, combat troops are deployed, uh, it's for six to nine months. Um, in our most recent conflicts, these deployments tended to be repetitive. So you had a six or nine month deployment, you got a month off, maybe two months off, and then you were sent back for another six to nine months. So you have a lot of separation from your uh, family and friends. You're in uh, certainly uh, difficult conditions. And so, you know, now that you have a veteran who's come back and, and, and if you're working with them, what does that mean? You know, and, and really understanding that sense of uh, commitment. Um, there's a reason why, uh, you know, when we look at Vietnam veterans that they travel halfway across the country to these memorials and will do, uh, you know, charcoal uh, imprints of their friends that are listed on these memorials that have died. Uh, there's a reason why, um, you know, uh, when you go maybe to the county fair, you will see uh, folks wearing hats and pins and, and really remembering their service and where they served. Uh, that's, I think, a huge piece to recognize um, clinically uh, and um, certainly deserves uh, our respect. So here's something to keep in mind. Um, for most of us, the most stress maybe we have in a given day is the 405 or the 91. If you're not from California, you're missing out. <laughs> Those of us from California, um, maybe anywhere actually in the country of the world that has high traffic, can probably relate to uh, sitting in, in congested traffic, uh, listening to the radio. That might be the extent of the stress that we might have in a given day. Um, in the military, stress is your life. It's your life from uh, really the moment you step on the bus and wave goodbye to your family. That's kind of where it starts, that separation, that sense of loss and uh, fear of where you're going, what you're going to do. And so I think it's important to recognize that that has uh, an effect both psychologically and uh, physiologically on the body. The hours, living conditions, and roles are very different than what uh, most people would be used to. You know, um, I know lots of people, the idea of camping, per se, is uh, pulling up in your RV and sliding out your, your slides and sleeping on a, on a comfortable bed. Um, ask a veteran what their idea of camping is, and certainly if they've been in the Marine Corps or the Army, uh, or even some specialized units, it might be, you know, a wet sleeping bag, if they're lucky, in the rain, you know, with uh, wonderful meals ready to eat. So if you uh, are wondering sometimes about some of the acronyms, um, ASK, um, MREs as they're called, are wonderfully delicious. And I say that with a tremendous amount of sarcasm. For those of you that have served you I'm sure you can remember your first experience with uh, food in a bag uh, from World War II. Um, so you know the hours can be varied they can be long uh, they can be at all all types of conditions uh, and, the, and the thing to understand is there isn't the option to in most cases call in sick there isn't the option to not go in that day you're kind of there and, and you have to uh, deal with that you certainly, there's a loss of old coping systems in families. Uh, you know, many young men and women go from uh, a, a variety of areas across the country, and uh, if they're lucky, they're sent to uh, their initial training and, and could be stationed close to home. But many of them aren't. You know, when you're looking at uh, the Navy or the Marine Corps, um, you're sent. You're you're usually gone very, very far from home and the people that you know. So you have to develop new coping systems and, and strategies and, and a sense of a family. And so 
I think it's important to, to recognize how does that impact somebody that, that has had maybe a strong support system uh, when they were in New Jersey and now they're on the west coast of California, which is a completely different cultural experience in terms of the environment and the people that you're around. But now you're in a completely new realm and uh, it's very uh, difficult. And technology has certainly made it easier. Um, I didn't have uh, video chat and the internet uh, when I was in the, I had to rely on letters and that was interesting, you know, writing a letter and then having to wait for it to return and uh, the importance of that I think is sometimes lost. Lastly, you know, uh, the last two things is, you know, taking a life. And I, I, I said it a little bit earlier, but I think it bears repeating every service member, every uh, member of the United States military is trained to take a life. It's just an is. And if you disagree with that, it's okay. But um, I certainly caution folks who have very maybe strong uh, political beliefs or political positions uh, working with veterans because we tend to pick up on that rather quickly and uh, the best clinician is the one who can get people to return. You can be the best clinician in the world but if folks aren't going to come and see you you're not going to do any good. So having that rapport and having uh, someone kind of come back to see you is the only way that you're going to get to do the work that you want to do to be effective and um, veterans have a, I think a keen sense of you know, to pick up on uh, biases and, and maybe uh, some of the anxiety around that. And so it can certainly be a challenge. And lastly, I've mentioned it before, but certainly, um, you know, giving a life, uh, being able to uh, take an order. Uh, and that's the other thing is, you know, um, we're all subject to our uh, commanding officers and, and non-commissioned officers in the United States military and so it's important to recognize that uh, you know I, uh, we have to honor their um, willingness uh, to sacrifice so all right <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about uh, complex PTSD this slide's a little busy I apologize for that but in relation to our current conflicts <clears throat> the APA and, and uh, other researchers have really started to identify uh, post-traumatic stress as more than just uh, what we outlined in the DSM-4, that we're really looking at uh, something that's more chronic, that's more pervasive. When you expose a human being to uh, repetitive uh, life-altering uh, events. It's, you know, uh, history <clears throat> plays such a big role in the, in the armed forces. Uh, and I think that when you're working with veterans, it's important to kind of establish where are they at uh, history-wise. Uh, your Vietnam conflicts, very different than your, uh, your first Desert Storm conflicts, which are very different than you know, your, your Bosnian or your uh, South American conflicts in the uh, mid-90s to your uh, now our, our current Afghanistan and Iraq uh, conflicts. Very, very different in terms of uh, the types of deployment, the types of conditions, the types of enemies that they faced. I think that that's really important to understand uh, when you're trying to work with veterans. <clears throat> in the past, you did a deployment and you had six months or more. Maybe you only did one deployment in your entire military career. Uh, there's many, many veterans now that are coming back from our current conflicts that have been deployed multiple times. And that uh, doesn't, it never allows the body a chance to accommodate it. Never, you never come off of the super extraordinarily high stressful situation. You're always there. And so we've seen that, you know, when you look at uh, veterans, 
and the issues that they face, uh, we see a lot more substance use assaults, uh, driving related incidents because, as, a, as a result of this chronic and pervasive exposure to uh, the environment that, that they were in. And so traditional PTSD really fails to kind of capture some of that complexity. And so um, I, I want to highlight that a little bit because, you know, this, the, the sense of, of safety and security really uh, has changed uh, with our current conflict. As, you know, if you've been following the news, uh, more so a couple years ago and last year than, than currently, but we had some, some incidents where uh, we were working with um, the Iraqi and the Afghan army and members of those uh, uh, militaries actually turned out to be terrorists and would uh, walk into uh, military cafeterias because they were allowed on base, they were given access, and they would blow themselves up or throw grenades. And so you had, again, your, your, your comrades, your brothers now, you're being asked to work with right, because we tend to globalize, you're being asked to work with a, a group of folks that maybe someone else in that group uh, a week ago had killed some of your friends and family. And so that there's no safety in that. There's no way that you will ever feel safe in that environment. And so I think it's important to recognize that. <clears throat> um, as a consequence of this, you know, we see the results uh, from our parents uh, and our children uh, I'm a, as my dissertation talked about, I'm a big fan of attachment theory. I think that <clears throat> for me, it just made sense. You know, the, the folks that were around, our caregivers, is how we form our identities and our attachments. And so we have uh, young men and women who have come back now with uh, a much more severe chronic type of post traumatic stress disorder that uh, are having families and raising families and those elements of uh, heightened sense of security and paranoia are gonna translate uh, to young people. And so <clears throat> we have much more of a 24 hour news cycle. So vicarious trauma and the sense of being uh, re-victimized. Um, there was a, a very interesting article the other day in the news about veterans uh, being triggered, triggered because they had spent a lot of their sweat and blood and the blood of some of their friends uh, capturing the, the city of Ramadi over in Iraq and now it's fallen to uh, militants. And so, you know, these are the things that, were, that are uh, very present in uh, uh, our, our media and uh, our, our information stream as it were. And so, you know, when you're working with veterans, I think it's really important to kind of stay current on what's going on because, you know, if you've been working with somebody for a, a while and now they come in and there's something different, that may be it. You know, they may have lost somebody um, taking control of that city and, and establishing some sense of order, and now it's all falling apart. And so what a sense of loss for them that they've, all of that, was that for nothing? You know, you really begin to question why. I mean, those are the the normal human uh, emotions and aspects of that we all go through. So I think understanding that really plays a role in how we treat it. Um, and certainly, you know, when we're looking uh, social and emotional development, kids are going to uh, pick up and adapt on uh, the environment that they're in and, and their caregivers. And so if we have <clears throat> uh, veterans who are not getting treatment, or even if they are, are still at a, at a very high state of anxiety, uh, we're gonna have anxious kids. Uh, and uh, doesn't mean that they're ADHD. I know that that's uh, kind of a popular diagnosis that's been going around recently. Um, so it requires more work on our part as a provider to really understand the complexity of uh, their illness and where they're at. Uh, whether you're working with the, the veteran, the family, uh, and the kids. And I, I, I kind of want to go back a little bit. I think that that's something also to, as it relates to culture, you may not work with the veteran. You might be working with the family members and, and understanding what it's like for them to 
have to move away from home, have to move away from their support group. Um, there are, uh, I, I, I read the news a lot and I can't remember the last time I read a story about a new military installation being built. Maybe I'm wrong, could be, but even if it's, that's the case, they're certainly not being built uh, as fast as your, your most recent shopping mall. So what does that mean? Well, uh, we had a tremendous amount of military expansion uh, in World War II. And so for the families taken away from home, now put into an environment that is 1930 in terms of when it was built. And so something to keep in mind, right? You're in a new environment, you're in uh, base housing, you're on a military installation that could be very old, uh, that doesn't necessarily maybe have uh, a lot of current uh, technology, right? Current uh, plumbing. So these are just some issues I think to keep in mind as, as you work with families and uh, children of families is, is that they, uh, they face a significant amount of, of, of sacrifice and burden as well as they follow the veteran uh, and as you work with veterans and talk with veterans um, you will find that some uh, we call them uh, posts in terms of where you're stationed some posts are better than others there's some really uh, old ones out there and so uh, I think that that's important to understand so this definition here says that it's a psychological injury that results from protracted exposure uh, to prolonged social or interpersonal trauma or lack of uh, loss of control, and disempowerment. So this is um, really kind of part and parcel to military life. There is not a lot of control. You're told where to go, when to go, and many times how to go and uh, separated from family and friends uh, you may come back after have seen some of your own friends so you've had a maybe a uh, an experience where you've lost someone maybe you've even felt that you you, you yourself might die and you're uh, sent back and you get a little bit of time to reconnect and then you're told again you have to go back so this is, this is something that I think we miss from the civilian side. It's um, maybe a good analogy is similar to our, our uh, firemen and police officers, right? The, the house is still on fire. Uh, you need to go back in, right? That's the, the aspects of, of being a veteran. You have to go, you might have to go back. And I think recognizing that is really powerful, right? Um, being self-aware, uh, you know, one of the things that hopefully most of us learn in grad school when we're becoming uh, therapists is to know yourself, right? Know yourself, know your own triggers, know where you're at, uh, your own mindfulness, your own personal space. What would it be like for you to be told, run back into that burning building, run back into that combat zone, right? go back into that dark alley at night, even if you don't want to. Right? You're going back to the place where maybe you've lost friends. Right? Are you next? Is it your turn? So there certainly can be a, uh, a detachment from life in a sense. Right? You're going back with a very high probability that you might die. And so psychologically that, that takes a role, uh, I, say, I should say a toll on, uh, on folks. And so I think it's important to understand that that protracted exposure, that protractedness of having to go back into these uh, war zones uh, is much different than it used to be with other conflicts. And so we see a much more severe form of post-traumatic stress disorder. So, so what we see is a very, uh, it's difficult to regulate emotions. Physiologically, we see enlarged adrenal glands. The limbic system has been 
programmed, right, from 17, 18 years old to respond to a high level of stress and anxiety. And so now all of a sudden you've left that environment, you've uh, maybe left the military, and now you're trying to uh, integrate back into a completely different world, right? It's, it's 180 degrees. It's just completely different. And so coming back from those environments, um, the body, in many regards, is unable to adapt, right? Uh, for many of these folks, you're talking multiple, multiple years of living uh, a particular way. And I think it's really, really important to understand that you can't fix that in 10 sessions. You can't fix that in, you know, group therapy once a week or once a month. It, it's just not going to happen. This is a very uh, complex illness that is going to require uh, lifetime, in a sense, management. There's a tremendous amount of research that's coming from the substance abuse field that's really looking at substance abuse as more of a complex disease, kind of like diabetes, where you have to really address it that way. You have to look at the, the symptomology and address the lifestyle and the symptoms and manage it more from a, a, a life perspective of how do we integrate and organize our lives around managing this illness. And I think that that's something that as we look at uh, the really uh, severely traumatized folks coming back from, from combat and these experiences that they're going to have uh, a, a, completely way, a, a completely new way of relating to the world. And as providers, we're not going to fix that overnight. It's going to take a much more uh, long and, 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 and integrated approach. Um, certainly some uh, uh, disassociation or relieving the traumatic events, those are pretty standard with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, you shame and guilt, you know. I mean, that's, that's something that we hear a lot. Why did I survive? Why wasn't it me? Uh, uh, you know, I lost my entire uh, platoon or my entire squad of, of, of brothers. You know, why was I? So, you know, treating veterans isn't just treating post-traumatic stress. It's working with shame. It's working with guilt. It's working with identity. It, it requires specialization. <clears throat> My maybe soapbox, if you will, as a provider is don't go into this treatment field lightly um, because it's much more complex. You're going to have to have an understanding of how to treat substance use. You're going to have to have an understanding of how to effectively treat shame and grief and loss in addition to post-traumatic stress disorder, right? In addition to maybe a traumatic brain injury. What are the physiological effects, the pharmacological treatments that are available, you know, this becomes much more of a specialty the more we understand about it. And so it isn't so much as um, getting your, your license and going out and, and wanting to work with, with uh, veterans. It's getting your license and then probably spending years understanding veterans and additional training on how to treat these issues to effectively uh, treat this population. <clears throat> okay. Um, Lastly, the, the, the loss or changes in, in, in meaning. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's been 20 some odd years since I've been in the military. <clears throat> I still identify and have my own sense of identity of that time of my life. I, I, I still call myself a, a veteran or an airman. You, just don't ever lose that. It really becomes integrated into who you are. And so I think it's important to recognize that when you're working with folks, whether they were in for four years or whether they were in for 20. Uh, and certainly as they progress through life, I think it's important to, to understand that um, many times, certainly for our, our Vietnam and I think soon for our Desert Storm veterans, they have organized their life and maybe organized their experience around these identities. And now as they start to approach retirement or appro approach uh, 
a different aspect of their life, they may not necessarily be equipped or to be able to understand how to cope and adapt to a new phase of life. I've always considered myself this and organized my life around this and now it's gone or I'm retiring and now what do I do? Uh, we've seen a lot of Vietnam era veterans that have retired and now all of a sudden we're seeing this increase in, in substance use and DUIs and like, well, what's going on here? Well, they, they came out of Vietnam and organized their life around their jobs and that kept them kind of secure and, and stable and then that went away. Now what do they do? Right. Um, so uh, I think we need to keep, kind of keep that in mind. So some treatment approaches. Um, Complex trauma means complex reactions, and this leads to complex treatment. <laughs> uh, so it really is uh, multidisciplinary, uh, comprehensive. It requires adapting uh, our approach. Certainly establishing safety and rapport, I think, is uh, very important. If a veteran doesn't feel safe with you, you won't see them. That's just kind of the bottom line. Certainly having a sense of remembering and, and, and mourning for what was lost. Uh, I've seen cases with recent veterans who not only struggle with their experiences in the military, but also struggle with their sense of loss because they lost maybe some of that connection to their old friends and family. Right? Shipped halfway across the world, gone for four years or more, and then you're coming back to your hometown and you're a completely different person, but everybody else is the same. Gee, now what do I do? How do I connect to those folks? So reconnecting with community and, and uh, society at large, uh, it's difficult, right? Um, people may not understand the experiences, the environment. How do you navigate that? How do you negotiate that? That's what's going on inside veterans. You know, how do I go to Walmart and you know feel comfortable with people around me? Where when I was just uh, you know a few months ago in an environment where anybody around me could be a threat. So again, it requires long-term, very complex treatments around. Uh, attachments around friends, families, activities, uh, therapy, sometimes medication. Uh, and then lastly, um, well not maybe not lastly, but uh, recovery really only occurs within the healing relationship. And so uh, we have to empower um, folks by that relationship. And that might mean helping them find new support systems, new support groups. Uh, we are by our very nature, social creatures, right? I mean, even uh, the folks that uh, disengage from society in a sense, uh, I'm always reminded of um, Tom Hanks in that movie, Castaway. He's on a desert island all by himself. Uh, what does he do? He forms a relationship with a volleyball. And we may think that that's r weird, but to me it actually kind of made sense. Like, wow, well, gee, I kind of get that, you know? You, we're social. It's part of our, our, who we are. And so without that, without that ability to connect and establish those relationships, I think treatment becomes very, very difficult. So that really is important. Um, we have to look at the emotional dysregulation. You know, uh, veterans do not operate in the same world that everybody else does. It is completely different, right? We do not go to work and have to worry necessarily about our boss telling us to go do something that maybe we don't want to do. I mean, sure, <clears throat> we would get fired. Okay, go find a new job. No big deal, you know, I'll grab a Starbucks on my way home. <laughs> In the military, if you disobey an order, you go to jail. Completely different set of rules. I'm not sure how many people maybe understand that. Uh, we have what's called a uniform code of military justice, which is different. You don't necessarily have 
freedom of speech. You know? It's against the law in the military to criticize the commander in chief. You can't openly, you know, as an active duty service member, sit, you know, go out and say, you know, I hate the president and you know, I wish he was impeached. You'll get in a lot of trouble. You, know? uh, you have to take care of yourself. You know, I've seen uh, friends uh, punished because they got a sunburn and couldn't work. You know, so I think that that's important to kind of recognize that, that there's a different set of rules and and experiences that veterans live under, and then when they're coming out to reintegrate into society, trying to merge those two uh, is going to cause uh, certainly a large amount of anxiety and, and frustration. Um, Interpersonal problems and substance use tend to be the catalyst uh, for treatment when you're working with veterans. Most veterans are going to be pretty hesitant to seek out treatment on their own. While we've made significant progress in destigmatizing uh, treatment and mental illness, uh, it's kind of counter to the culture of uh, the military as a whole. You, uh, you suck it up. You keep going. You keep moving forward. So. The concept of uh, admitting something is wrong or admitting that you're somehow uh, quote unquote weak uh, is very uh, anathema to uh, what it is to be in the military. So it's, it'll continue to be a, a challenge. So you see a lot of folks that'll come in uh, as a result of a substance use or an interpersonal problem. And so again, having that experience, you know, it's not just going to be working with the veteran and just working on PTSD you're probably going to have to do some family counseling. You may have to do some substance abuse counseling. These are you know, very, very complex issues that they're going to be coming, coming in with. I have yet to treat or even meet uh, someone uh, from the military seeking treatment that just has, you know, I just want to be seen for my PTSD. That's it. Nothing else. It like, doesn't exist. So uh, having that uh, training and experiences can be uh, very, very important. So, the first thing I think is is don't assume. Uh, even for me, coming from the military, I always try to ask. Uh, come from a place of curiosity where you're really trying to understand what was their experience. If I'm a cook in the army and I never went overseas, is a very, very different experience than I was a cook in the army, you know, in Kuwait or, or at a base in Iraq that was under constant mortar fire from insurgents. Very, very different. And that's something to really understand. I think there's a tendency to, when we hear combat, to think that, oh, this is someone who had a gun and was out there shooting at somebody. That's what combat was. Like, no, that's not. A combat deployment is multifaceted. You could be on a ship, you could be uh, on an air base, you could be out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and all of those things and the logistical support that goes with it is combat. So again, you could be treating um, a female truck driver who's worked in the logistics, whose job was just to transport food and water to other soldiers and they happen to be stationed in Kuwait or Iraq or Afghanistan and maybe that convoy was attacked by an IED or came under uh, uh, some other type of fire and guess what? They've been in combat. So we don't necessarily, so it's important to ask and not uh, assume and associate what we may think a role or a term means to the same experience uh, from the veterans. Really ask them. Um, these last two are really kind of my own soapboxes and, and my own experiences. Um, and if you don't support the military, don't treat them. You can be the most kind, greatest clinician in the world, but please don't. Just make a referral. I think trying to force a square peg into a round box is the worst thing that you can do. I mean, one, they won't come back. It'll be pretty obvious, but um, sometimes... Uh, you, know, you can have uh, mandated uh, cases that you might work on. I just think it's really important. If you really ethically care about the, the service that you're giving, the care that you're providing, if you don't really support them or support the wars, that's great. You're entitled to your uh, uh, personal and political beliefs. 
I certainly appreciate those, but don't treat them. Don't treat us. Uh, it'll just do more harm than good. Secondly, um, if you have trouble with violence, uh, this is probably not the group that you want to work with. We are, by our nature, violent. I think that you have to recognize that. As I said before, every single Marine, every single soldier, every single airman, every single sailor, every single one of them, one of the first things that they are trained to do is to kill. That is, by its very nature, violent. Right? Now, not everybody goes on to do that. Some people go on to be doctors, lawyers, cooks, clinicians, you know, receptionists. There's a lot of jobs in the military. But at its very beginning, its very nature, it is violent. And so if you have difficulty with that, this is probably not the group that you want to work with. Certainly, if you're going to work with folks that have been in combat, uh, it is going to be violent and bloody and gory and messy. And I think a good clinician has to be aware of their own triggers around that. They have to be able to sit with that because uh, clinically you're asking somebody to, can you handle my stuff, right? Can I trust you with my stuff? And uh, veterans will share a little bit and that's kind of a test. They're going to look, can you, can you handle it? Can I trust you with this one small piece because the rest of it is really ugly, you know? So I think that's, in a sense, why the veterans prefer veterans, you know. Um, it's not that if you're not a veteran, you can't effectively treat this population. I think there are some very good clinicians that are, are not veterans that do an excellent job, but they are really skilled. They've taken a lot of time to invest in the background knowledge, the, the complexity of it. So I say that in the hopes that if this is a population that you want to work with, my hope is that it's, you will take that extra time to become an expert in, in the field and become an expert in what it takes to work with this population. Um, and then from a treatment approach, really I see three things that are really critical to establish when you begin treatment with a veteran. First and foremost, sleep. That's the easiest way. When you start looking at uh, complex trauma, PTSD, even anxiety issues, uh, I start with sleep. How are you sleeping? <laughs> you know, and do a good sleep assessment. Are they really getting six to eight hours of restful, healthy REM sleep? You know, a night. If not, that's where you start. You start with because if, if we don't sleep, if we're not getting that refresh and recharge. Everything else is much less effective, so you've got to start there. Secondly, connect to the family. You know, connect not only to their military family, but their, their extended family. You know, how do we now reconnect? Um, how does the, the family reconnect to uh, the soldier coming back? You, know, you have a lot of young men who um, are coming back from a conflict and this may be the first time that they're seeing their child, right? And there's, there's a natural anticipation and build up to this event, right? I mean, gosh, I'm, I'm gonna see my, my son or my daughter for the first time, what an amazing experience. And the son or daughter is freaking out because they don't know them and they, they start crying, they don't wanna be around, right? Attachment, attachment stuff. So. How do we process that? How do we work through that? How do we help them establish that connection it becomes very important. And thirdly, their role as the provider for the family plays very uh, heavily, I think, on both men and women as they are uh, leaving home or coming back from long deployments. What does it mean when those roles change? When family members have now taken care of all of the normal daily routines of life, right? The grocery shopping and the, the mowing the lawn and now all of a sudden here's someone 
coming back into that environment, where do they fit? So again, it, I think it really ties into having an understanding of uh, family systems, being able to work with the family because these issues do not operate in a bubble. You're just not gonna treat the, the well, I'm not sleeping well and I might have some post-traumatic stress disorder, okay? Do you, are you, do you have a family? Do you have kids? I mean, what else is going on? Because that will play, I think, an, in, an integral role in, in successful treatment. So lastly, my cautions right, to providers out there. So before you can save the town, you must first save yourself. And I don't remember where I got this from. I think I picked it up. I, I was um, lucky enough to go to uh, the FBI's uh, crisis uh, negotiation, the hostage negotiation course down in San Diego about a year and a half ago or so. And I took this away because it really stuck with me. I think it's important to recognize this, and uh, I don't think we can repeat it enough. As providers, there's this tendency to be rescuers. We want to take all of this emotional energy and baggage, and, and I think of it like a stone, and you kind of put it in a backpack, and you're walking around with this backpack, and uh, if you don't eventually take off that backpack, it'll break you. And so I start with... You have to escape from the stress, you know, work, your hobbies, uh, taking time off, um, even playing video games, talking to friends. These, these are things other than work, right? And this is going to be a real struggle. Certainly, you know, when I've worked with uh, military and, and police and firefighters, like, oh, yes, I go out and hang out with my friends all the time. Great. What do you talk about? Well, we talk about work. So we kind of get into this repetitive nature of you never you never let it go there there has to be a point in time um, to, to to let this stuff go and to uh, release some stress the R is rest mindfulness um, I, I put lying on the grass uh, here in California we won't have grass anymore so uh, we don't have to worry about that you can maybe find a chair but uh, it, it really is just a sense of um, Letting go, I think, of our, our little plastic buddy, right? It's like, anybody know a person like that? It's like, ah, my precious, you know, from the Lord of the Rings. I can never let go of the phone. Uh, take a day, take a weekend where you turn these things off. It's amazingly powerful, you know. Um, so resting is very important. Uh, lastly, play. Laughter and, and, and fun is extraordinarily important psychologically. I mean, the, the research is very clear, you know, in terms of the, the physiological benefits of play and laughter. Um, so funny stories, uh, being creative, um, physically active, I think, is very important. Dancing around the, the campfire is good. Just be careful that, uh, you know, the campfire's flat and level. Uh, I had a, have a story when I was younger where something, I kind of lit myself on fire, dancing around a campfire at an angle with gravel. It's like, not a good idea. The things you learn when you're young. So, you know, there's, it's, there's, times, to, there's times to work, but there's also times to play. And I think it's important that if we take care of ourselves and are at our best, then we're, we have um, a greater capacity for handling uh, the emotional, the stories, the things that are required to, to work with this population. So uh, be like Wyatt Earp, right, in a sense. Eat, rest, and play. Um, um, so at this point, uh, I will take uh, questions, uh, and we'll kind of go from there. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. Lots of questions coming in from uh, the virtual audience. And I'll start there and give our in-person crowd here a chance to kind of gather their thoughts. Uh, a learner named Josh uh, writes that he's read that there's a higher incidence of PTSD among veterans that have experienced traumas prior to entering the military. And he, he's wondering if you might speak to that and should the military maybe do some pre, and do they, do some pre-screening for at-risk individuals? So certainly any um, <clears throat> traumatic events uh, are going to condition the brain to be more susceptible to future traumatic events. I'm not a 
neuroscientist, uh, my limited uh, understanding of uh, physiology of the brain uh, leads me uh, to believe that, you know, certainly at a young age, traumatic events at a young age tend to get encoded uh, pretty significantly uh, depending on the nature of the trauma. So the, the type, uh, the, the protractedness or the length uh, of the trauma as it relates to the age and uh, the severity to that particular individual is certainly going to create a, a foundation for future trauma. So going into the military um, may or may not necessarily be the best choice. In terms of screening, I think it's really important to understand that when we look at uh, screening or psychological testing, that these things are not necessarily a panacea. Uh, they tend to be very time intensive, very uh, labor intensive, uh, and quite honestly, um, not always as accurate as we may like. I, I, I think it's very important to remember that even today in 2015 with you know, Facebook and Skype and all of the wonderful things that we do, there is still no cure for mental illness. There is still no whiz-bang instant blood test or quote-unquote brain scan that we can do to identify these diseases. They are still very much reliant on self-reporting. So, you know, a, a diagnostic screening is uh, only, um, has only limited value. Do they do it? They do it a little bit more. Uh, but again, it's a matter of, of resources and time. Uh, to my knowledge, th there's not a, a heavy investment in lengthy MMPI screenings for psychosis or some of the other more common uh, illnesses. It's, it's, uh, it's just not viable, I think, at this point. Um, there are more, uh, the military has instituted more resiliency programs mm -hmm. and, uh, and mental health support systems that are available even to uh, service members that are on uh, deployment. Uh, and that seems to have evolved a lot over the p past couple of decades. In your opinion, have those been effective in reducing the, the instances or severity of PTSD? Well, I don't know if they've been uh, effective at reducing incidences or severity. I will say I think they've been effective at uh, maintaining a connectedness to family and support groups. Um, in the past, uh, the way to connect was old-fashioned, you had to write a letter and put it in the mail and, and then wait for a response. Uh, today, uh, similar to what we're doing now, you have uh, instantaneous video chat where you get to see somebody and connect and, and hear from them. And I think that that's uh, psychologically very, very powerful to be able, uh, kind of no matter where you are in the world, uh, to be able to see your, your family or friends or loved one um, has a very profound uh, psychological effect. So I think it, it serves maybe as a, as a buffer, um, but I'm not sure. Again, I think it's going to depend on where they're stationed and what they're doing as to its effectiveness at uh, reducing incidence of PTSD. Okay, uh, a learner named Monica, uh, in reference to your uh, discussion of uh, there are more women in the military and the role is changing. Yes. When you see women come back with PTSD, are, are there any differences between women and men in the symptoms that they uh, present with or in your treatment? Um, of course. Uh, women and men are different uh, physically, uh, physiologically. Um, and so uh, while the underlying diagnostic elements of post-traumatic stress are going to be similar, uh, the experiences, the, the roles will play, I think, pretty significantly on how you decide to, to treat that individual. Again, so much of this is brand new that we really don't know. There isn't a tremendous amount of research on women in combat because women have never really been in combat. So it's going to take, I think, some time to really understand how is that going to translate into effective treatments as more and more folk, uh, women come back from, from those roles in, in combat. In, um, in past conflicts, Generally, there were front lines, and if you were away from the front line, you were uh, at least reasonably safe. Yes. And today, that's not the case. And in addition, um, civilians, perhaps even women and, and children, are, are potential threats. What, what impact do you think that has, that, that change in the warfare theater, 
What do you think that Im impact that has had on military mental health? Uh, the analogy that I used, uh, uh, Walmart, there's a wonderful um, video series that uh, was done by a gentleman named uh, Dan Weinstein a few years ago called um, uh, it was Understanding Valor. It was funded by CIMH, uh, which is the California Institute of Mental Health, and it was these small docudramas around uh, military folks, and, and uh, it really talked to some of those incidents. You know, how do you spend months uh, driving around uh, Fallujah, wondering if anybody around you uh, is going to be uh, a threat or, or, or harm, and then kind of come back and sit in traffic or try to go to the store. So it creates a huge dynamic, and uh, you know it's it's going to continue to be an issue as um, warfare evolves, uh, and you know we'll have to as providers adapt and, and uh, create treatment approaches to address it. Uh, when you, certainly when you look at like CBT, there's a lot of data, a lot of research out there that talks about the efficacy of CBT. Well, that was a population 30 years ago. How has that evolved and how do we adapt? So um, I would agree that it's going to continue to change and, and we're going to have to just uh, do good research and, and look at ways that we can effectively treat it. I had a question. First of all, thank you for your presentation. I really enjoyed it, Dr. Taylor. Um, I wanted to know if you are aware of any research um, in terms of mindfulness practices, more specifically meditation um, with um, and treating PTSD for veterans. I've done research in that area and I've found some things with meditation and PTSD and how it changes the brain structure and it helps, but um, not so much with veterans. Are you aware of any studies? I'm not aware of any studies per se. Um, I would say that uh, mindfulness, uh, meditation play a role and I think as good providers having an understanding of where that fits therapeutically can be very important. Again, these are complex. They're, this is a complex disease. It's, I think we have to broaden our scope beyond just talk therapy or just beyond a uh, an antidepressant or some sort of a, a medication. I think we really have to look um, medically but also holistically and how can we integrate those. Uh, I think the bigger challenge is going to be how going forward how do providers communicate right because uh, if I'm the therapist uh, how would I communicate with uh, with the pharmacist or the the psychiatrist, how am I integrating, you know, meditation or yoga or exercise? How am I integrating those into, into treatment? Um, I know there's a tremendous amount of research around uh, EMDR and how it relates to specifically combat veterans and its efficacy there, which is not meditation per se, but I think the, the foundation of EMDR is a sense of mindfulness. These are kind of the newer frontier. You know, I tell my students, this is a great time to be involved in healthcare. Healthcare is changing. I mean, my goodness, we we're doing some amazing things uh, healthcare-wise. So, you know, when we look at some of the more holistic approaches, um, I think you'll see more research coming out about how we integrate those, how effective they are, where and when uh, they can be used. Great answer. Um, thanks for your enlightening talk today. It's really quite interesting. I want to get back to uh, one of the first uh, topics that was brought up, and that was uh, the pre-screening. And um, as we know, we've got a, an enormous cost to treating um, as many veterans as there are now for a complex PSD, PTSD. <clears throat> and uh, it's you know, it's a huge cost to society, and it's an opportunity cost as well. Um, have, have there been, has there, there been that much work, to your knowledge, and I'm not sure I got your answer on this, to the pre-screening, where you've got two similar soldiers with similar backgrounds, and what is in their psyche that allows one to see all of the things they see, experience all of the things they see, and not be effective to the point where they need you know, post um, post war treatment, uh, uh, you know, and 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 his friend does who saw exactly the same thing. Uh, so, 
it, see, it seems to me it, it behooves us to uh, do that screening up front rather than incur these costs uh, um, due to these risks later on. As a psychologist, I love psychological tests. <laughs> we should do them on everybody, right? Drivers. You know, I know plenty of drivers that I wish that I could probably say, you know what, maybe we should give you a test and not give you a driver's license because obviously you might have some rage issues. So that being said, uh, I think philosophically, um, from my point of view, I see change as happening more in line with generations. Honestly, I think it is uh, younger generations that experience uh, life and begin to push the envelope into change to real change as they age and grow up and, and that's where you see real things happen I mean when we look at history you know um, you go back 30 years you know uh, maybe 40 which isn't a tremendous amount of time in our history and if you you could be standing before the judge and the judge would say okay you've got a choice you can go to jail or you can enlist in the Marines, you know? That was how it was done, and that wasn't that long ago. Well, generationally now, we've, we've learned from those experiences and said, you know, that's probably not the best idea. So I think we've got a way to go where we continue to push the envelope, we continue to uh, talk to lawmakers, or we continue to get elected and bring these issues to the forefront and be able to say, you're right, it makes a heck of a lot more sense to maybe invest a little bit more time on the front end than on the back. That being said, we're an all-volunteer army, and so you know, in order to maintain uh, a certain level of status, uh, I would imagine that sometimes you can't be too picky. So I think, again, do you want um, the most well-balanced person for your highly sensitive jobs? Absolutely, and they get a lot of screening. Do you want somebody, do you want to invest, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars on MMPIs and, and functional MRI scans on your cook? Maybe not. So I think that we have to kind of find that balance and see what makes the most sense. There's a sense of guilt, I understand, or a difficulty with some service members coming back with PTSD issues, but no physical, uh, visible, physical, um, you know, they haven't lost limbs, they haven't, you know, had a bullet wound or whatever, and their um, shame that they're dealing with going for treatment alongside someone who has these more visible, obvious physical wounds. And I was just wondering how you approach that shame or that difficulty in the clinical setting when working with those, you know, invisible wounds with our wounded warriors? I think you have to be, when you're working with veterans, very careful around group therapy and your group selection. Because if you don't really do a good job of screening who's a member of the group, it can really become toxic very quickly because uh, it's very easy for folks to say, you know what, you absolutely cannot relate to my experience because you were never quote, quote unquote in combat and it won't go very far. Secondly, uh, I think your question really relates to how do you train yourself? How do you become an expert in working with shame and working with grief? What have you done, you know, from a conference, from a continuing education, from a reading point of view? that's going to give you some insight in how to deal with those issues. And then, kind of in the moment, can you work with that person uh, to get them to reconnect? Because for me, I think, you know, when you're looking at shame and guilt, certainly around death, because that's what we're talking about. You're talking about, well, I didn't get hurt or I didn't die, you know, and my friends did. So you see that disconnection from life. So I think part of processing shame and guilt around those issues is really connecting that person back into living. You know, and uh, that could be as simple as, you know what, well, uh, after our session today, I want you to take a walk or I want you to sit outside or I want you to journal. I think we have to 
um, be very creative in our therapeutic approaches with veterans and really find something that they might be interested in that connects them to life and to living and then use that as a springboard for further treatment. As far as you were talking about sessions and the amount of time you'd be working with clients and just from your presentation today, it just sounds like um, complex PTSD just seems like something that's going to be lifetime associated almost. Um, mm -hmm. What kind of complications are there when it comes to coverage, number of sessions? When is it time for the therapist to start looking at like, okay, let's put a, an effective aftercare program together and uh, when is it time to say, okay, it's time to terminate services? So let's talk a little bit about policy. Uh, uh, we have the Affordable Care Act, which has changed health care. Uh, we had mental health parity, which changed health care. So in theory, on paper, uh, if you have a mental illness, post-traumatic stress disorder being a mental illness, theoretically, and I say that, you know, um, there should be no limit to the amount of treatment that you could get for your mental illness. Because under the federal parity laws, the mental health side has to mirror the physical health side. So if you had diabetes, right, they couldn't say, you know, your diabetes hasn't gotten any better uh, and it's been a couple years now. We're not going to pay for your insulin anymore. <laughs> Sorry. Right? So I say that somewhat sarcastically, but what that means is as providers, we have to, again, it's kind of putting on another hat. Uh, you have to stay up to speed on uh, the regulations that unfortunately are constantly changing around health care and, and insurance laws and what does that mean depending on their insurance and what state they live in and, and how does it all work together. And then the second piece of that is really becoming an advocate and, and using that knowledge to say to the veteran, hey, guess what? You don't have a limit on how many times we can see each other, right? And it is chronic and it is complex and this is what we're going to need to do to keep you better. So the other, the last piece to that is it really is a, again, a generational shift around stigma and how we think about mental illness and how we think about treatment, right? Because at some point we have to then start talking about policy around the sort of care, you know? How do we, do we, are we able to wrap our heads around the idea that someone who was deployed three times to Afghanistan was in combat, maybe they were never injured, but certainly, right, came back, has PTSD, and now uh, it doesn't go away. Their brains have been changed forever, right, and are going to need some form of treatment, right, for the rest of their lives. So how do we talk to, how do we have that conversation with the individual? How do we have that conversation with policymakers around, you know, insurance and legislation. How do we have that conversation around for employers, right? Because, uh, you know, um, nobody, at least I hope not, nobody goes out and says, oh my gosh, you have diabetes and you have it for the rest of your life. Ah, you're a horrible person. We can't hire you or, you know, we're going to do all these things. And yet when we talk about depression or anxiety, bipolar, PTSD, these are the realities. And so, again, I see it as a generational shift where the younger generation comes up and says, gosh, you know what? I've got depression. Sorry. Yes, I treat it. This is what I need to treat it. And that uh, kind of translator permeates through society so that folks can feel safe in having those conversations with their family, with their friends, with their employers. You know, I, I use a great, uh, maybe not great, but um, I use an analogy when I, uh, with students most of us, even today, probably would never go to our employer and say, guess what, I've got bipolar. Just wanted to let you know, right? <laughs> Whereas many of us like, oh, you know what, I've got cancer or I'm struggling with, with, you know, with an illness or I've got multiple sclerosis. And we raised, we raised millions and billions of dollars around breast cancer research. And you know, if you were to go to your employer and say, you know what, oh my God, I've got breast cancer, I need to take some time off, they would rally the, to the world to help you. We're going to shave our head and make woods in solidarity. We're going to do all these things. Woohoo! Right? But very few of us would be willing to go to our employer and say, you know, um, I've been diagnosed with bipolar. So we've got a long way to go. So that's my opinion.
So. Okay, I thought yes. I'd wrap up with two, two quick questions from the uh, virtual audience. Uh, there's been a lot of talk in recent years about the potential of video therapy, especially with this, um, with this population. For example, you might be able to bring um, members of a unit together who are now scattered across the country and do some sort of a group session. Are, in your opinion, are, are we seeing any of that potential realized? Yes. Just, you know, um, healthcare is probably moving faster than we can kind of keep up. Uh, we're using telemed uh, where I work. Uh, I honestly believe um, and that three to five years from now, society at large will, their first contact with a healthcare provider will be through their computer. They will log into their healthcare provider, they will answer some questions, and they'll be connected uh, videoly to a, a, a crisis nurse or an LVN who will do a pre screen and will say, okay, yes, come in, or no, don't. I'll talk to the doctor, we'll write a prescription, we'll send it to the pharmacy, uh, and, uh, or um, in the case of my healthcare provider with Kaiser, uh, we'll, we'll mail it to your house next day. So it's changing very, very fast. So I think that the incorporation of technology is gonna continue to expand. The VA is using um, apps around PTSD uh, for, for breathing and stress exercises. So I think it's gonna just continue to evolve and expand. Um, and for me, again, it's another hat that you kind of have to wear as a provider. What are the available options? Uh, are you aware of them? Uh, how do they work? Uh, are you going to incorporate them into, uh, you know, your therapy? Uh, so it, it becomes much more complex, but I absolutely see it becoming a, a, a vital piece of our, our treatment system. Great. And final question. Today we've talked a bit about uh, pre-screening mm -hmm. before people enter the military. We've talked about... Uh, uh, the services that are available uh, while they're on deployment. How about programs? What exists for service members that are transitioning out of the military and into a civilian environment? What does the military provide in terms of training for that transition? So it depends. Uh, I love that answer uh, as a psychologist, right? It depends. <laughs> I always get that question, you know, you'll, you'll hear a vignette or someone will say, what about this? And like, well, it kind of depends, you know, I need more information. So it depends on their role, depends on where they're stationed. Um, so depending on all of these factors, there are a lot of uh, transitional programs that are you know, three to six months to help people kind of transition back into civilian life. Personally, I think it's inadequate. I honestly don't think you can spend you know, many, many years in these very highly complex roles, sometimes involved in combat, and then be expected to participate in a essentially an outpatient program for three months and all of a sudden you're gonna be ready to go right back into civilian life. So I think from a policy point of view we need to look at what makes the most sense. Um, I'm, I l tend to lean towards uh, you know how many years were you exposed to uh, maybe some traumatic events that should be maybe equal the number of years we need to spend trying putting you back together. I don't know if that's possible uh, from a policy point of view, but I think we owe it to veterans to really explore better ways to integrate back into society as a whole. Um, so we're doing a lot. Uh, there's a lot of different programs out there, the Army, uh, Marine Corps, everybody's got their own unique spin on programs. I think that's a piece I didn't really talk about in the presentation, but it's important to understand is that the, your, the branches of, of the service while they work together, they don't always necessarily talk to one another or mirror one another in their approach or the program. So you could have a program for uh, re reintegration in the Marine Corps that you would not have in the Air Force. Or you could have completely different programs or completely different approaches. So it, it really ties back into being curious and asking those questions about, okay, where did you serve, what was available, and then kind of going from there. So we can do more. Unfortunately, that brings us to the end of the program. Dr. Taylor, thank you so much you. for uh, your fantastic presentation. My pleasure. So fortunate.